Thanks very much, Emily. Join me for a word of prayer. Open up your word to us, O Lord, so that we might hear from you in a new and fresh way. We ask you to take uh, the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, that it might be acceptable in your sight. This we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. About two years ago, the college began imagining what would be a, a good tagline for Gordon College. Over the years, we've had some different phrases that have become part of the, the Gordon vernacular that have functioned in some of the ways as a tagline. One was your adventurous life. Another was freedom in a framework of faith. But as we talked to a lot of external constituents, we learned that those particular phrases actually raised more questions than answers, which is the opposite of what you want a tagline to do. The whole point of a tagline is to be able to express the essence of an institution with an economy of words. So as we talked to churches and to alumni and to schools, we realized we needed to keep working on it. As our creative team was trying to come up with something that would sort of help capture the essence of this place, I told them that I wanted a tagline that would have biblical resonance, that would be tied to what we know makes Gordon great, our strategic advantages and the direction in which we're headed, but I also wanted it to have the amplitude to speak to the variety of constituents and stakeholders that Gordon seeks to serve. Those of us who know and love Gordon realize that this is an extraordinary place and it's really hard to sum up what makes Gordon so special in just a short phrase. Clearly, this is a place that's a lot better than just the sum of its individual parts. This is a place that's beautiful, arguably the most beautiful college campus within the Christian tradition across all four seasons, really in the world. It's beautiful. It's also a place where uh, we've earned an, an enviable reputation within the pantheon of higher education for being a place that develops intellectual maturity and spiritual maturity and does so with great integrity. But what really makes Gordon so special are the people. In my particular role as president, I get a chance to know about a number of colleagues who are unsung heroes, people who help make all of our lives a lot better. Chris Hansen, for example, within our Center for Technology Services. He tirelessly works to make sure that you are able to do simple things like email and to access the internet. Even when our network goes down at 2 a.m., he comes into the office. He's done it a lot of times in the last year. Professor Kay Cook is in the process of putting together a grant proposal that could be transformative for how Gordon does its work, particularly with international partners. She does it without a lot of fanfare or attention, but it has the potential to be truly transformative, not just for our faculty, but also for our students. Neil Erickson and Tim Ferguson Sauter, our design center, are part of the creative dream team that we have here at Gordon. And they've been turning out amazing work day in and day out, week in and week out. <clears throat> Within the last year, I asked them if they would apply their creative genius to helping us think about the campus aesthetically. So the fruit of their wonderful work, you can see by the new entrance off of Grapevine Road, by a lot of the renovations that we've seen in Jinx. Then you can see their work in progress over at the Bennett Center this month. And then there's Liz Wittet, who's provided tremendous support and encouragement to our faculty in humanities and social sciences. She does it in her own quiet, serving way, but in the process, she's made a lot of people's lives a lot better. I could go on and on. We have an amazing array of people who really love our students. The thing that unites all of them, however, is a shared sense of purpose. We believe, fundamentally, we are here to try and honor Jesus. And that's a, a sense of purpose that has united believers for two millennia. That's what takes us to Colossians chapter 1, our passage this morning. We believe the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the believers in, in Colossae while he was imprisoned in Rome. We think it happened around 61 AD. Paul had actually never been to Colossae, but he had a deep connection because he lived in Ephesus. And the church at Ephesus actually gave birth to the church in Colossae. They're separated by about uh, 100 miles, Ephesus being on the Aegean coast, the Aegean Sea, and Colossae being uh, in, inland by about 100 miles. It's a cosmopolitan city in Asia Minor, what we now know as modern-day Turkey. In some ways, Colossae was to the ancient world 
what Los Angeles is to our society today. It was a, a place of um, cultural uh, activity, lots of different things that were happening. Three main different ideological streams flowed into this cosmopolitan city. Judaism, Greek philosophy, and paganism. So it was sort of a mush pot in ancient Colossae. It was a place that was always in transition. Partially was because it was a city that was prone to a lot of earthquakes. And within that particular milieu, the early Christian church in Colossae was struggling. Paul wanted to make sure that in the midst of all the confusing ideologies that were swirling around ancient Colossae, that they stay true to the key idea of the gospel. Jesus is Lord. In just four short chapters of this book, he mentions the name Jesus 26 times and refers to him as Lord seven times. Paul focuses on the lives of the Colossians. The reason is because for him, theology is not so much about right thinking as much as it is right living lives. Paul writes, we always thank God for you since we heard about your faith and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope that's laid up for you in heaven. In one simple sentence, Paul mentions the three cardinal virtues of the Christian tradition, faith, hope, and love. It's interesting because faith, hope, and love are not so much emotions that we feel as much as they are characters that we do develop through intentional discipline. Virtue formation is a really interesting thing. Uh, Rebecca and I are getting a chance to see that up close. You all know we have uh, twin daughters, Emily and Caroline. They are four. And you can see how they cultivate virtues in their life. It's interesting because for all of us, certain virtues come more easily than others. Emily, for example, for her, faith comes relatively easily. She has a deep trust in other people, and by extension, a deep trust in God. About a year ago, we lost Rebecca's grandmother. We call her Sweetie. And um, Emily talks frequently about how she's going to see Sweetie in heaven. For her, it's a surety. She's able to take that on faith and believe in it. Her sister, Caroline, on the other hand, she embodies what we call in the academy the hermeneutic of suspicion. For her, she's not taking anything on faith. And yet, Caroline has this amazing ability to demonstrate the virtue of love. It just naturally overflows from her being. Every, every night when I come in from the office, she greets me at the door, gives me a hug and kiss. Then we go back to my bedroom, and I change out of my suit into more comfortable clothes. And Caroline tells me about her day, and then she asks me about mine. I have to tell you that that little four-year-old, she actually ministers to me because she's genuinely interested in me. So whereas faith was hard for her to develop, love comes naturally, and vice versa. Whereas Emily is easy, can easily embrace the virtue of faith, love comes a little bit more challenging for her. <laughs> One day, Caroline and Emily were fighting, and just instinctively, Emily reaches up with her bare hands as if to strangle her sister. Now, I don't think Rebecca or I have done that, at least not in front of the children. <laughs> so where does she get that? For all of us, character and virtues have to be integrated into our life, and some will come more easily than others. In the midst of trying to develop that, Paul urges us, by writing Colossians, for us to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, as one translation puts it. The metaphor of to walk comes from the Jewish tradition, which is basically a, a way of understanding how we ought to conduct ourselves, how we ought to pursue the lives that we are to lead. This particular passage is one that says, there are certain ways we ought to live because that's how we bear witness to our core beliefs. Lives, and what are they worth? Worth is a term that connotes value or meaning. What is all this right living for? College is a great time where you get to ask the big questions. Who am I? Why am I here? And what am I supposed to do with my life? One of the great gifts is that 
a place like Gordon gives us a chance to grapple with those questions honestly and also in a caring community. Paul's prayer for the Colossians appears in verses 9 to 12. He writes, We don't cease to pray for you, to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord. Or as one paraphrase puts it, to pursue lives worth leading, fully pleasing him, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, for all patience and endurance with joy, giving thanks to the Father who's qualified you to share in this inheritance of the kingdom of light. People are oftentimes asking about making investments and if it's all worth it. I get asked that question all the time. Is a Gordon education worth it? Those of us on campus know about uh, six weeks ago we celebrated Tuition Freedom Day. That's the day on which no longer are your tuition dollars paying for what you get at Gordon. The rest of the year, what we're enjoying today, it's been paid by folks who love this place and want to make it possible for you to be here. You see, the total cost of educating a single Gordon student is $55,000 a year. That's significantly higher than the total price. Why are people willing to invest in this place to make it possible for you to be here? It's because they want you to pursue a life worth leading. You see, they see in you the hope of the next generation. Out of you will emerge the next leaders of the global church. They can invest in a wonderful ministry that serves the developing world by helping directly, or they can give more strategically by investing in you because you're gonna be one of those people who will go and lead that ministry in Africa or Southeast Asia. They believe deeply that this is an investment worth making. Because they recognize that you can go to lots of different schools and learn about calculus or chemistry, but you're not gonna find that to be an opportunity to develop spiritual understanding about those disciplines and how they fit in with your own God-given calling. One of the things about this particular institution is that we provide chances for folks to be in a community that encourages that spiritual understanding. You see, Gordon is a place where the professors, they don't teach subjects, they teach students. And because of that, they care deeply. They want to explain the elegance of a mathematical formula because they think it reflects the glory of God. They're interested in a commitment to creation care, not because we have a campus recycling program, but because we want it to be deeply embedded in the very way we do our work like Professor Irv Levy does in our Green Chemistry Initiative. The goal of the Christian life is a transformed one. And how we develop that sense of transformation, it occurs in different vocations, whether that be entrepreneurship or social work, ministry or theater. At too many institutions of higher learning today, Students are pushed and prodded to what's called as excellence. But once they get there, they realize that actually it's a superficial kind of excellence. That there are no institutional bulwarks to protect them from the seductive sirens of status or of self-promotion to which we all can be too easily drawn. You see, if we're gonna pursue a life worth leading, it's not just about getting an award or landing a great job or having a happy life. It's about developing the kind of character that Paul writes about in Colossians 1. A life worth leading where faith, hope, and love naturally flow out of us into the lives of those around us. So we're trying to help cultivate, in a biblical sense, lives worth leading. Paul says to the Colossians, I have a prayer for you, and it has four parts. Number one, he wanted us to have lives that would bear good fruit in every good work. Two, that we would increase in the knowledge of God. Three, that we'd be strengthened for patience and endurance with joy. And four, that we could give thanks to the Father for the inheritance that we share within the kingdom of light. 
One of the things about being in a community like Gordon is that we can spur one another on to good deeds. I find the chapel services I come to to be challenging. I, I come because I want to be supportive, but oftentimes I find myself getting convicted in one way or another. There's something I've been convicted about where I don't feel like that I have been pursuing a life worth leading and I've not been leading you very well. It comes from the imperative of the gospel to go and share the good news. When was the last time you verbally talked about your faith? If you're like me, it's been way too long. A couple of months ago, I was on an airplane headed out west and um, I have sort of a routine. I, I travel a lot for the, the college and uh, typically I sit down and um, I'll sort of exchange pleasantries with my seatmate, but then I'll get on my laptop and really try and get some work done. I tend not to be very good conversationalist on the airplane because this is like, you know, concentrated time where my iPhone is not buzzing, where I can actually get some really good work done. When I was on this particular flight, I was, I was next to a guy named Larry. He was on his way to Orange County, California to go and see his girlfriend. He was friendly and was asking me various questions. And um, I had to sort of have a conversation with him because the flight attendant was handing him a drink and I passed it over to him. Um, he started asking me a lot of questions and I tried to sort of give very short answers because I really didn't want to be in a long time conversation with him. But I have to say he was so charming and gregarious that before I knew it, I said, well, do you live in Boston? The moment those words left my lips, there's a little critic in my head that says, what are you doing? Now you're going to be stuck in this hour-long conversation. He's going to talk to you, and there's not going to be a way to get out of it. So Larry starts telling me all about his life and his experiences. He mentions a law, he's a lawyer. At that point, I tune him out entirely and start trying to figure out what is my exit strategy of how could I possibly get out of this conversation. While I'm sort of thinking about this conversation, I hear the phrase special needs, and my ears perk up. As many of you know, Rebecca and I have a special needs daughter, Elizabeth. So I stop and I said, I'm sorry, Larry, what did you just say? Turns out, Larry is one of the nation's leading experts on disability law. Larry was the person who helped write the legislation here in Massachusetts that made it possible for families to be able to get the kind of training and, and support that they needed for their special needs kids. It was landmark legislation that frankly has made Massachusetts the envy of the entire country for their ability to pay for and care for those who are the least among us. I couldn't believe I was sitting next to a man who my family was personally benefiting from. So I started asking him some questions. He in turn asked me some questions about what I did and why I was so interested in the case law around special needs kids. I told him about Elizabeth. In that moment, I realized, you know, I don't have a lot of occasions where I'm sitting next to somebody who might have a very different faith orientation. So we started talking about various things and just eventually it came to a moment where I'd say, God gave me a, a sense of unexpected courage. And I just said, you know, Larry, you strike me as somebody who cares deeply about morality and ethics. What do you think about the person of Jesus? You know, it's interesting, the moment you mention the name Jesus, the conversation sort of turns. And I thought, well, it could either go badly or well, but here is the, the turning point. Turns out that Larry is a, a Jewish man, uh, that he had always wanted to read the Bible all the way through. He talked about the beauty of the King James Version and how he was struck by Jesus as a moral teacher. And that was really impressive to him. That in turn led us to talk about the grounding of our ethical behavior and how we think about moral choices, how we think about caring for other people. In the process of that, as I'm talking with, with Larry, I begin thinking about how can I turn this conversation in such a way that I can lead him in the sinner's prayer while we're 38,000 feet in the air and I can sort of get, you know, my evangelistic bonus points for the week. But as I prayed in the midst of that conversation, it just didn't seem right. And I asked the Lord to sort of help me to think, what's the right way to close this conversation? 
Before I knew it, uh, our plane landed in Dallas. We exchanged business cards, and we went our separate ways. But Larry stayed with me. I got on the next plane and was flying and sort of thinking and praying about Larry. I thought, Lord, what could I do that would help carry the conversation forward? I decided when I landed that uh, maybe what I could do is send Larry a Bible. He said he wanted to read the Bible all the way through. So that's what I did. I wrote him a note. I actually ended up giving him a copy of Eugene Peterson's translation of the Bible, which is called The Message. I wrote to Larry and said, I know you asked about the King James Version, which you can certainly still read cover to cover, but I think you'll find the message to be more readable and perhaps more relatable to the kinds of things that you're doing day in and day out. Larry got the Bible a couple days later and he called me in the office and said, I've started reading. Now I have no idea if Larry will ever place his faith in Jesus. The Bible talks about how we plant different seeds and other people will water and sometimes we're able to see it bear fruit. But I have to say, just by having that conversation with Larry, has done an enormous good in my own life. That something about having the occasion to try and bear witness to your faith verbally makes a real difference. And so my encouragement to all of us this morning is to take stock. What is it that God is calling you to do today? About a week before I went on that particular flight, Myron Shire Studer, our librarian, sent me a quote that came from A.J. Gordon, our founder. Myron sent it to me because he thought maybe I could use it for a, a talk I might give or something around the college's 125th anniversary this, this fall. Little did he know that that particular verse would stick in my mind and that this particular area of my life where I needed to bear witness to my faith would spur me in a new and fresh way. This is what Dr. Gordon wrote 125 years ago. We've come so much to regard humility as a cardinal virtue of Christianity that we may have forgotten that the Christian should actually be ambitious. John Stott describes evangelism as being ambitious for the kingdom, a willingness to speak boldly, to share what is the fruit of our lives, to walk in a way that is worthy of the Lord, such that the virtues of faith, hope, and love naturally grow out of our lives and draw other people to Christ. That's a message that was applicable 2,000 years ago to the believers in Colossae. It's applicable 125 years ago when Dr. Gordon started this institution that we love. And I think it's applicable to us today. At least on our better days, I think this is what we are called to spur one another on to pursue. Lives worth leading. Let's pray. Lord, we really do want our lives to reflect you. We recognize that too many times we're intimidated to pursue the kind of life you would call us to. We lack the, the moral courage or the fortitude, the discipline or the willingness to step out. But I pray, Father, that today we would be encouraged. May we be a community that spurs one another on to good deeds. May we have spiritual understanding as you wanted to give to the Colossians in Paul's writing. May we also acquire that as we seek to honor you so that we might share in the, in the inheritance of the kingdom of light. God, we ask you to take our minds and think through them. Take our mouths and speak through them. Take our hands, our feet, serve and love through them. And take our hearts, set them afire, 
that we might be changed people having encountered your word for our lives today. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Our visiting students, we invite you to stay seated. Everyone else, God bless you.